Welcome to Perceptions Today podcast, where we discuss consciousness in all forms. February 2023, episode 41, Natural Born Alchemist discussing indigenous cultures and plant healing in a roundtable, part two of two. Natural Born Alchemist podcast discusses indigenous cultures, plant medicine, shamanism, consciousness, psychedelics, philosophy, and much more. <laughs> I have to say, Myron, that links nicely into Miro's story that he's going to give us. And then obviously we can get to centered awareness and then we'll get back to Willow because obviously she's been bounced out and she's back again now. Over to yourself, Miro. Hi, good afternoon from Canada. I just came uh, from California where my daughter was attending uh, a Waska ceremony. I was supposed to go with her, but... Uh, kind of misunderstood of dates. So when I was uh, leaving the uh, country, she in the morning she was driving me to airport and in the evening she went to uh, a Huesca ceremony. It, it is, uh, there is a group of people from uh, Peru, uh, shamans, and it is in, uh, it is done in uh, desert, actually not far from place where Myron, is, I guess. Uh, I didn't have chance to talk to her yet, uh, just very briefly. Um, this is she, an instance she, she, of the conversation she, she coming up in the roundtable discussion. Uh, Participants knew it was being was recorded. To Shaman. I was present, was talking to him, so he gave her advice what she supposed to eat, what she, what she supposed to do before. And when she was driving me to uh, airport, we were also talking about that and trying to also um, help her. She has her issue and her psychotherapist actually suggests to go to a Huesca ceremony. Um, now I'm planning to go uh, back to California in uh, summer, in July, and hopefully I will be able to also attend the Huesca ceremony because I have also my issues, particularly um, because of my pain. So that's only shortly I want to mention. Well, that's fascinating, isn't it, Alex, that we've got people now actually from the Western medical side saying this. Yeah. And um, I want to also add a bit to what Myron was saying um, before I forget. Uh, and uh, one thing I, I me- we, he mentioned and I mentioned that uh, the distance between ceremonies are long, but I forget, forgot to mention that uh, it doesn't mean I am not uh, working with the ayahuasca plant in between these times, even though I don't drink it. Because um, an important aspect to ayahuasca ceremonies are the Icaros, the medicine songs that they sing. And I have them recorded and I listen to them. And I do trip when I listen to this music. It connects with me directly. And in fact, there's, they become such a big part of my life that I use, them, I use these songs to, to put my children to sleep as well. Now, Alex, it's, I'm not sure if you were here last week, but Shadow Fox's husband, Lee Two Hawks, who's listening, who works with sound, will probably be able to give you later or at some point or in this conversation the reason why that happens as well because of the way that he's been using sound for healing yeah i was listening to it. i i did only for like the first half hour um but i i because i was driving um and then also i wanted to add he mentioned myra mentioned obedience and uh, i must say that since i started working with ayahuasca I, i've been very obedient and mainly or most of the major decisions in my life since then has been the ayahuasca that told me what I should do. And I've done it. Not small stuff, major things like having children, what job I have, ending my cannabis addiction, uh, and also that I should live in a house in the forest. So, um, so uh, I, I am very obedient <laughs> Hang on, Alex. That doesn't go with everything you normally say. You're normally an anarchist. No, I, yeah, I accept, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but obedience doesn't fit. When it comes to the ayahuasca, I'm very obedient. Part-time because, anarchist, are you? Okay. Yeah. That's the, re- the reason I am is because if I, I know what happens if I haven't done what she says and I come back because uh, I, then I get a, a, a trashing uh, and I don't want to, that to happen to me. Because uh, she's like a, 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 what do you call it, a, a, a what's it called when your parent is very strict and, but well, still tough loving. Master. Tough love. Uh, tough love, exactly. Tough, very tough love. <laughs> okay, now that we've got back to centered awareness, then it'd be Willow and then Shadow Fox. Oh, oh. sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, it's Centered Awareness, then Willow, then Shadow Fox. I, I see what y'all did there. That was cute. <laughs> um, okay, so this this is another question out to Alex or anybody else has the answer. Has anybody heard of the um, American Indian tribe called Karunkawa? Because I was going into years back. I think I've mentioned this in a few of these rooms. Um, and I was and talking my sleep and I never I never speak in my sleep but uh at the time I woke myself up and Karunkawa 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 and my ex said what are you when I had woken myself up and I said I don't know I keep saying Karunkawa and he goes I'm looking it up and he said it was a uh, tribe uh Aztico. um so I was just if Alex um about this tribe or if anybody else he has I, I haven't heard that name before how did you want to try and spell it well, I I kept I remember I kept it with an N, Karunkawa, and so is that with a K I, first? Yeah, so K A R A N Karunkawa. That's how I kept saying. Um, and you yeah, think Mexico? Spoke, yeah, and they spoke to somebody else, and they said, "Oh no, you're you're talking the Karunkawa," but he was spelling it C H, and it was somewhere in America, I think near Texas. But when I was talking to him. I was like, no, no, no. I'm pretty sure I kept on saying it with an N, Karankawa. That's how it was sound. Karankawa, I sent a link to you. Okay, thank you. I'll have a look. Willow, I think you're up. I can't oh. believe that Alex basically struck Melissa speechless. Thank you, Shadow Fox, for spotting that one. Willow, your question. My question is, um, okay, wait a minute. So, uh when when I was in Peru, I uh, I that summer I went and sat of a pasana course right after uh, working with ayahuasca, and so that summer was jam packed with a lot of really um, tough lessons. But I just wanted to throw that as another way of I, I think if if I were to do it again, I would do it in reverse, and it would actually sit of a pasana course first and then go. Um, you know, and work with plant medicine as a, as a way of preparing, you know, you know, um, and yeah, that's what I would have done. Um, and I think too, that there's been, like somebody said, when we think about integrate, yeah, I, I just, that word just came, it just came to me, means something different to me right now than it ever has before. So I'm appreciative of that, uh, that piece, but I wanted to tell, uh, centered awareness when you were talking about, when you were asking uh, about saying that you'd been thinking about going, um, right then my my uh, friend Fate called. His last name is Fate, literally. And uh, so I just wanted to share that with you um, because I think that uh, the Mother Ayahuasca certainly works in mysterious ways and uh, perhaps that's a sign. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. And I, I, I can... Definitely. Before we move on to the next one, centered awareness. In your direct messages, I found a link. I'm not sure if it's the correct one for the people that you were looking for, but take a look. I will. I'll do that. Thank you. Now we can move on to Shadow Fox, and then obviously we've got Lexium 400 drums. Can you see anybody else's hands up, Ian, or has we got everybody? I, I think it is nope. everybody, but I think 400, 400 drums can go before me. Okay. Rianne? Rianne? Hey, um, I, I, I wanted oh. to comment after Willow. Um, yeah, this is this is Rian of 400 Drums, by the way. Um, just on the the Vipassana comment, um, because I think it's it's a really um, important, if not vital, uh, in working with plant medicines to have a bit of a, a meditative practice. Um, so I think it's it's a really good idea to be thinking about those kind of things. But I have I've done a few Vipassana retreats, um, and actually my most recent podcast episode. Um, maybe I, maybe I'll share that or something. Uh, plug uh, yourself, what, plug your podcast. Uh, but on my recent one, I did a bit of a podcast around. Uh, no, the, plug your podcast name. 
reincarnation, like a play on my name, Rian, R I A N, reincarnation. <laughs> um, I'll 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 give a natural link and like put up a post in in a, in a little bit, or even for one of the other shows. But I just wanted to mention that. Um, so so I've gone to two of these, and the first one that I went to, um, it's really amazing. It really activated me for a particular meditation technique. And for most people who do meditation, they'll do a guided one every now and then until they learn how to do breath based on a pana meditation. Um, most people have not even gotten into the kindergarten version of their method because it really does take like 10 days of silence at one of these courses to really get the intricacies of what you're doing with some of these techniques. But all this to say, um, not that I did ayahuasca after my first Vipassana retreat, but I am, I'm a, I'm a heavy cannabis user for, for insomnia, for uh, pain. I use it to teach me to walk again after I had a back injury, um, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm very familiar with it. Normally a good tolerance, need it to sleep for my insomnia. But when I came back from Vipassana, I had been off of cannabis for the like 14 days or so. Cause I, I did a few days beforehand of, of not being on it because I knew that I wouldn't be on it. And uh, I, knew insomnia was going to come. So I just wanted to get kind of used to that. Um, and in coming back, it was a great time. And it's a story in itself an unbelievable, probably the most psychedelic experiences of my life happened um, at Vipassana in meditation. But in coming back, I went back into cannabis on that on that first day. And at first, I was kind of I was smoking with my wife, now wife, um, and just having a good day. But in the evening, we decided to take an edible. Um, edibles and uh yeah edible forms of cannabis had just been banned in vancouver at that time it was in the gray market it wasn't legal in in vancouver at that time anyways though it is now but they made it so that all the gray market dispensaries only had um uh concentrated oils they couldn't sell cookies or like brownies anymore because apparently the the emergency room had kids who have eaten chocolate, et cetera. Um, so, so when we got back, my wife surprised me, my now wife surprised me with uh, Phoenix Tears. If any of you don't know what Phoenix Tears are, they're also called Rick Simpson oil. They're an unbelievably concentrated, thick cannabis tar of an oil um, that people use for treating cancer, both topically you can get rid of melanoma, but you can also treat internal cancers with very high doses of Phoenix Tears. So, when I got back, she had surprised me with this and we both went to take one dose and we each thought half of a syringe of this was one dose. Um, typically Hang on, you before you go anywhere, what a quantity in milliliters because syringes come in so many different sizes from small vaccination to horse insemination ones. So syringe, like a typical, well, a typical dose of cannabis, if you have no tolerance, the, like the, the minimum effective dose for people to start getting the psychoactive effects is around five milligrams of THC um, in a syringe of Phoenix tears. There's 600 milligrams. So half of that is 300 milligrams. Um, even for a lot of people who don't have any tolerance, they can often take up to maybe 10, maybe 20 uh, before it's, it's, it's quite powerful for them. So I did 300 with no tolerance and I had a full psychotic break um, panic attack uh, I thought I was Jesus and that I was the Buddha that uh, two, 2,500 years after the Buddha, 2,000 years after Jesus, that the those lineages combined on to me. So I, it, it, I'll, I'll link my podcast because it has a funny description of the story and the context of Vipassana beforehand. But Does I just also want... say how you got back to your normal. I, I, I talk I, I talk about that whole story, but I just, I just... You have to give us the episode. Just tell us what the episode is as well now. 21. It's the most recent episode of, of my podcast. Um, uh, it's called uh, Silence and Insight, Bliss and Fear with Jesse Wallach, um, who's also been to the retreats. But I just wanted I just wanted to, to mention this in, in regards to what you were saying, Willow, because A, it is very vital to be able to uh, have some kind of meditation practice to be able to get to the depths of what you can learn in psychedelic realms. But at the same time, the depth that you can go into with Vipassana is such that if you add an alternative substance very quickly when you're back before reintegrating after the trip that is Vipassana you can do yourself even more damage um, like now I can take that same amount of cannabis and I'll be totally fine actually it might even kind of give me energy 
um, and make it so it's hard for me to sleep. <laughs> but I just, yeah, I just wanted to mention that because a lot of people um, will, even at Vipassana, it's worth noting that even like, let's say you don't have a meditative practice, like many people who go to these retreats don't have, they just, oh, you know what, I'm never going to meditate. So I'll go to a 10 day in a Buddhist prison and I'll be able to, to meditate now. For a lot of people, if they don't prep, even with learning a bit of meditation first, there are many uh, reports of people who commit suicide or have full psychotic breaks at these silent Vipassana retreats. Because you're not, it's not just relaxing on oh, meditating for 10 hours a day and not able to talk to anyone or read and write. You're, you're really unraveling um, who you are, who you think you are, your personality, your psyche, what has made up the scaffolding of your mind and what you think. And until you're ready to actually face that by kind of slowly wading into those waters, it can, it can be very challenging for people. So I just wanted to mention, yes, do Vipassana because it's one of the best ways to get depth in a method and that will help you in all plant medicine circumstances. But you need to still be kind of careful even with that. Like the the realm of the mind, just as uh, Myron said, like you, you, you're in all these places anywhere and you anyways, and you don't really need the psychedelic to get there. But if you're going to go out into these waters with a psychedelic or without, you need to make sure that you have the tools to be able to float. <laughs> so that's all I wanted to mention. No, that's all very valid information. Um, I can't believe, oh, obviously you're stacking me up with lots of listening material and with the things that you've got there. It's obviously such an intense experience, what's going on there. After Shadow Fox has gone through, Centered Awareness will be bouncing out in less than 30 minutes, so she's going to be going to work, so then we'll be talking to her, but hopefully we'll be able to do Shadow Fox and then go to a Willow and then go to Centered Awareness. So Shadow Fox? Yeah, I you know, I again I I'm I'm learning from you guys also. Um I just it's like I'm with Myron um for the most part because I and I guess it's maybe just from our near death experiences and perhaps other people. It's we're our that awareness or that connection um has already been made and I think that um, the plant-based um, aspects can definitely help people get there so that we can have almost a common dialogue. Because when we speak about there are no words for expression, like th this experience or, or that feeling, then it comes to a point where those people who have actually undergone ceremony and, and, and utilized um, this format kind of understand what we're speaking about it's like my guides are like instantaneously here at a moment's notice it's like uh, many people can meditate they raise their vibration and then they lower it and go to work um we you know my husband and i will meditate in the morning set our intent and then we hold that vibration we're always connected and um even when we're, you guys were speaking about where with sound, um, uh, being in whether it be um, lodge, whether it be in with pipe or anything else in those ceremonies, it we always use sound. We always bring music in, and that alone can also be healing. Um, but I would just like to make that point that you know I really my guides really I have to listen to them. You know, talk about, you know, obeying or doing what they're not necessarily obeying, but I choose to follow their direction would be a better expression for me, I think. But, um, yeah, I just think that it's all the way around. If it's something that is going to help you um, get to see some of these things that that we're expressing, then then please do so and join us because there are many different mechanisms that we can get there. And uh, Paul, you know, this is something that, you know, at some point in time, perhaps we can offer to the group because there are different, um, I call them their, um, it's an energy awareness and there are different techniques like a lead meditation that opens those pathways and those doorways up in order for you to connect to your own guides 
Can I just pause you there? Because I think that there would be a lot of people that would want to be involved in that. I just want to see if people would respond with the heart symbol to see if they would be up for that. Because I know there is a lot of us that would want to yeah, listen because... and try this. So, yeah, we're getting a good reaction. Oh, Fugi, nice to see you. Haven't seen you for a while. Great beard. Nice to see you in. And, yeah, because uh, there's so many different that. mechanisms to reach the same point. Um, and that can be done on demand, you know, and I just, it's like. And safely as well. And that's the thing, exa- isn't it? Exactly. Um, but if you just have one brief moment, because there's something that Lee Two Hawks would definitely just like to share on sound, if that's okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, you two are basically symbiotic. So I take you as one when you put your hand up. Okay. Well, here here's Lee Two Hawks and he, something from like ceremony. So. Okay. What I would like to do is briefly uh, sing. Uh, this is a pipe song. It's honoring the pipe. And we, Shadow Fox or myself, smoke a pipe. It is for the globe. It is not for us. It is for all humankind. This is the song we give for honoring the pipe. And in, well, in Lodge or any time. Right. You're matter. okay that being recorded, yeah? Because it is going to be yeah. recorded. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's perfectly fine. Away, oh, hey, away, oh, hey, oh, away, oh, hey, away, oh, hey, 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 and so it this is it's a blessing also um and this is from part of our culture uh shared with you thank you most definitely appreciated it does touch and obviously it makes your hairs on your skin kind of stand up yes and that's the part of of connecting and grounding and, and honoring and honoring it has a whole bunch to do with all of it so <laughs> thank you Thank you very much. A quick question for you, Lee. I presume everything you learn in the way that you sing, you learn by repetition from somebody else. That is, that is accurate. I, I added my own monochrome because when we send out a prayer or a message through song, we have to give voice to it in a manner of which we hope it will be answered. We have to be authentic. So if there's tears in the voice... That means, oh, so you mean the passion has got to be there. The it can't just be a mimic. Absolutely. Yes. Right, gotcha. There yeah. was a gentleman that we were playing drum with, and he didn't know he was going tap, tap, tap. I took the drum for him. I said, listen, if you're going to pray, if this is what you're going to do, the drum is not going to be heard if you go bang, bang, bang. It'll hear it more clearly than if you go tap. Yeah, it's and an this extension is what, of ourselves. This is what we extend to the... And this is one of the things that a few of us in here, like Ian, and also a few of my other friends, when we talk about people that we listen to who are making music, you can hear people who are just doing it by rote and they've got no passion in it and they're doing it for the money. Then you hear the people that have gone either through their own traumas, through their own lyrics, or they actually do put the emotion into it and you go, wow, they stand out about it. And it is just amazing how it makes you feel. The same yeah. with musical instrument play, as you say. See, and this is one of the sacred songs that the moment I hear it, no matter what I'm doing, it is, I mean, it just, I'm there. I'm immediately there. I, my, the frequency, the vibration, the rhythm of it all puts me into that place immediately. And, and again, this is why, you know, Lee Two Hawks had asked if he could share this with you. No, I feel honored that we have this put into our recording for our podcast and also the people here can actually hear these things. I mean, Rian, as you heard, is also the 400 Drums are bringing a kind of archive for songs and musical instruments all being put together as well so that people won't lose the traditions, which I think is amazing. I thought he would say something, but not. But anyway, right, Willow... 
that that is something that we that we really want to work on to be able to to, to share ap- appropriately um, and, and through protocol is being able to really record songs and, and teachings in those kind of traditions. But also um, with so many of these songs and, and these cultural traditions, there's also the sacred sounds of the instruments that would go with many of it. If it's the cultural regalia, like jingle dresses that have certain sounds from from the wearing of it, certain sounds of certain rattles and these things that have never been um, properly recorded. Um, we're, we're really going to work with our project to create a bit of an indigenous sound repository so that we can uh, really start to highlight and show what these what these sounds are ap- appropriately um, by the cultures for the cultures. So, yeah, just wanted to mention that. <laughs> Definitely. Awesome. And also, I've just put up your podcast into the shared section on episode 21. So that's up there for people if you want to listen to about his experience that he had and he was talking about. Willow. Oh my goodness. Well, uh, I, y'all just made me think of one more thing um, called rebirthing breath work, uh, circular connected breathing that really is quite subtle in terms of its ability to tap into uh, without any, you know, it's just with the breath in a different way than Anapana or Vipassana is. Um, can be done in a short setting, sitting. Um, very effective for me processing some of my trauma from my birth, uh, in which when I was being delivered, I had the umbilical cord wrapped around my neck twice. So, um, I had a traumatic first breath and that traumatic first breath really impacted my, uh, you know, who I, who I became, uh, and, the breath work allowed me to tap into and create a different relationship and integrate that experience in a way that was profoundly important. Uh, And it, it helped me heal some, some of that trauma that I didn't even know. I didn't, wasn't even aware existed between me and my mother um, because I had not, I didn't have memories of it. So it allowed me to connect to those memories that, Uh, had been, you know, unavailable. And that was really important um, for me in terms of some forgiveness that I needed to to do that I didn't even know I was operating from. You know, it was part of what where I was operating from and I didn't realize. So, um, yeah, it was very helpful. And um, I think some some of it is like kind of a kundalini rising type experience certainly i've had that as well um but it's very intense so yeah definitely i just appreciate that reminder um reincarnation because uh because i i needed that one yeah that was a really helpful tip um and the other one i was going to say is um i cannot remember this this she she does she does incredible she has these crystal bowls um, these huge sound, um, huge sound healing tools where she, and her name, I can never remember it. But anyway, I went one time to one of her um, sessions and I, um, I went blind uh, for, a pe- after, for a period of time afterwards. Um, it was quite, the energy was um, really, really, that's how powerful the sound. Um, was that a sound bath you went to? It was, it was at a yoga studio, um, I think it was at a yoga studio called Samadhi Yoga, and um, her, I want, I keep wanting to say her name is Maharishi, but it's, I don't know, I don't think that's it, uh, but it might be, um, it's something like that, it sounds similar, I cannot remember the name, she's very, um, she's a pretty well-known, yeah, um, sound healer. And was she using gongs, did you say, or was she using bowls? She was using their crystal. Crystal um, what? I don't know. What <laughs> shape were fi- they? They were in the shape of a U, you know, like a like a tall bowl. Like she had So it was a bowl, right, okay, right. Yep. I got mm-hmm. I'm very confused when you said it was in the shape of a U when Sorry, I, if you're I did ask it if it was a bowl. Perspective. Yeah. yeah, it would be a U. Um but yeah, a bowl, yeah. 
Excellent. I want to make sure that we don't lose the couple of questions that we got here. So we've got Zoom out and got 400 drums that want to come back to people here. And then, Ian, we're going to make sure that we don't lose your actual one about uh, experiences to Alex. Nice to see Fugi here and also nice to see Mike Frito back, which is good. And we get to Zoom out. Thanks. I have a couple. We'll see if it's a Hang on. <laughs> Don't say couple. We have one question first, and then we'll get the other one in. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess uh, directed towards naturalist. If he has anything on the origins of use with the indigenous cultures and its role in terms of the, the spiritual process, because it just doesn't seem to be quite in the same category as the rest. Obviously, it's psychedelic. Yeah, what, what was the culture around these? Well, the, from what I understand, the, the culture is, is eating it like edible, but I'm sure they also smoked it. Um, but um, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, that it's, uh, it's somewhere around Central Asia or, or like uh, Mongolia and that region, which is also the same region where the term shaman comes from. So maybe that's the connection. I don't know, but um, but it's sort of spiritual significance, the role that it played. In- yes, it would be. But the uh, but none just to of- give you the information, Alex, it was two thousand five hundred years old in a cemetery. They found it in Central Asia, and that's what they're talking about. It the earliest evidence of cannabis for smoking. Oh yeah, but as far as um, my direct experiences with indigenous communities. None of them have uh, used uh, cannabis uh, in a ceremonial setting or anything like that. But I'm sure there are some that do. Uh, so um, uh, so I only know only, from history. You know. I was only loosely aware of possibly there's yeah, the cliche, the peace part of that. Yeah, 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 yeah probably. To it, it's likely. The Shipibo in the Amazon, they don't like uh, cannabis. Not that it's a bad thing. They just say that... Um, well, they kind of phrase it this way that uh, it's um, uh, it's like a competitor. It it's it wants to take over everything. And the mother ayahuasca, the ayahuasca plant, is a a more grounded uh, teacher plant, holding the space of the earth, you know, guiding it or herding it. Whereas the cannabis is just spreading everywhere like a weed. Mm-hmm. So they had like this kind of view on it. So yeah, basically, it's the Swiss Army knife where you should be having separate tools. Yeah. Cannabis is the Swiss Army knife of it all. Yeah, uh, yeah it, uh, seems, uh, it seems to be strong, strengthened, like you said. But it, it is a medicine. Uh, I just think we're yeah. in the West uh, using it incorrectly as a, um, this, uh, like smoking a five joint A as a, and they're quite weak uh, each joint, and it becomes more like drinking or any other drug you take regularly. Um, yeah. But I think it should be used more as a medicine or in high doses. Then you get the real. It can be quite psychedelic if if you eat a lot of, of cannabis, or it is psychedelic. Sure I've put that article, sorry, been. Zoom, into your direct messaging about the earliest evidence of cannabis smoking discovered on National Geographic. Sure, I, I was just really um, trying to be specific to the role it in spirituality, uh, its origins. We have to dig for that one. I think which should be good. We'll come back to you, so put your hand up again if you want. All right, so 400 drums. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on on some of what was just talked about. First, the, the breathwork that Willow was talking about. Um, absolutely amazing stuff that that breathwork can do. And for people who's curious um, around potential for prenatal uh, experiences and being able to un, uh, essentially undo or at least work on um, prenatal and perinatal trauma. So when you're born, like Lilo mentioned, if you have trauma, it can completely wrap that that trauma can wrap itself around every part of your personality for the rest of your life until you're able to touch it and talk therapy and these kind of things. Trauma therapy cannot touch prenatal perinatal trauma because there's no language. This is before the time that you're able to differentiate anything. It's still in the oceanic feelings and then trauma happening. So um, Stan Groff, actually, who uh, helped develop LSD psychotherapy, he's kind of like the godfather of LSD psychotherapy, did 20 to 40,000 LSD 
um, legal LSD uh, sessions for people before it became illegal. Uh, he was originally in Czechoslovakia, then came to the U.S. and continued to do the work. And then as it was becoming illegal, he developed uh, holotropic breathing based on a lot of his research from um, from LSD and some of the, the come down that was happening and, and kind of developing this breathwork method. But it is very reliably useful for um, people being able to process different kinds of birth trauma and early pre-language trauma um, just from the activation and, and of, of the nervous system, hy hy hypoxia and um, hyperoxygenation. Um, what's important to know about something like holotropic breathing is it can be useful for that trauma work, but it is not a practice that you should do every day, specifically with holotropic breath work, because of the way that it brings you into hypoxia. It can be dangerous for the body if you do that way too much. However, there are other breath work techniques that can somewhat point towards similar um like perinatal, prenatal trauma, um, they haven't been researched and developed in those exact ways around that uh, that same research, but they are actually healthier for the body in general with um, almost intermittent hypoxia. So that's like the Wim Hof method, which I'm sure many of you have heard of as well. There's a, a, a technique that came out of Wim Hof method called Soma breath, um, which incorporates music and rhythm with the breath. And I find it actually is quite a bit uh, more useful for me than the Wim Hof method can point to those same kind of things and can really force interesting psychedelic like experiences. And what's really good about breath work is for many people trying to get into meditation. There's so many meditation techniques. Which one do I start with? Um, maybe that doesn't work for your mind. Maybe the breath is too boring or the visualization that you're doing is too complex. What's good about breath work is it physiologically forces your mind and body into um, some of these deeper experiences that you can get. So it can really help train your ability to sit in those meditative states without necessarily having to go through just sitting meditation, especially if that doesn't work for you. So I just wanted to, to mention that. And again, on my podcast, episode 11 is, is all about Soma Breath with Kyle Espenshade. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to mention is also around the indigenous cannabis use. So uh, in North America, someone mentioned the peace pipe. That was not cannabis. There was no cannabis in, uh, at least like in Canada and most of North American traditions. So even if you're thinking of ayahuasca cultures and stuff like that, one of the reasons that cannabis isn't accepted, like um, like he was saying, it's not because it's bad. It's because um, a lot like like to 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 master ayahuasca itself, it's already like 12 years of doing 300 ayahuasca sessions a year. So you're only getting 60 days off a year from tripping, which is kind of insane to become a master shaman. So to then add another kind of psychoactive into there when you're still doing dietas and all these other things to incorporate for becoming a master shaman, it is, it's, it's, it's a, a plant that hasn't been endemic to that area. So most traditions there do not incorporate it, though there are some that are starting to. Um, and they talk about it a little bit in the book Cannabis and Spirituality by Stephen Gray, which is like 16 different writers from around the world talking about different kind of uses spiritually of cannabis. But the other resource that I would point to around cannabis is if you look up the author Chris Bennett, He's done many books around cannabis, drugs, violence, and the Bible. Um, Lieber 420 is his tome of a book around like everything historical to do with cannabis, where its origins come from, how the Scythians used it. And the last thing that I want to point out, um, aside, like like uh, there's there's the China. Central Asia, 2,500 year old thing. But there's also um, new evidence that's come out in Israel showing that early Christianity, when they were doing um, like masses and stuff, they would be burning cannabis as an incense for mass. And they found remains at a temple site in Israel um, in, in an area where they there where they would have been doing this with cannabis and burning it on uh, coal, coal like embers to help induce a collective state of consciousness for whatever they were doing um so i just i just wanted to to hop in and mention those. that's a lot of information there which is great did you say scythians scythians were some of the first cannabis how did user. you spell that c-y-t-h-i-a-n-s i think 
Sith like like Scythians, but Scythians. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Got that. Which is great. I want to before we get because obviously Alex is going to respond to 400 drums, but because our co-host Centered Awareness will be going away very soon, I just wanted to bring her back in before we then obviously go back to Alex and then make sure we go to Fuji because I haven't been able to get to her yet. And then we'll go down the list that I've got already up here. And we'll try and keep everything to kind of like a three minute bit because we've got a lot of questions to get through. S Melissa? Yes. <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to say uh, a bit of work, but I want to thank you, Paul, for putting on another um, great talk. Thanks, Alex, for coming along. Thank you, Ian. Thank you to everyone that um, dropped it. I um, wanted to have a listen, and thank you to all the speakers for your contribution. And I'll see you all next week. Well, you might see us on Thursday if you are coming along to listen, but I know that's okay that uh, you might not be able to make it to Thursday. Thursday, I won't be able to. I wish that's I fine. could. Um, yeah, we'll be I'll thinking of you them. I'll make your Aww. apologies <laughs> thank you and sending love to all of you as well everyone thought that your niece having a fortnight was quite good that uh, you're making a pillow fort and sheets for her and giving her that as an experience oh did you share that of course That's nice. it's part thank of the community you. yeah I just didn't she wanted to share the bed with me on house um I'm in a halfway house at the moment with my mom and my sister and my niece. So she wanted to... Okay, centered awareness. There is a difference across <laughs> the globe about what a halfway house is. What you're doing is you're staying at your mother's house. Oh, a halfway a house is completely different in some other okay. countries. Sorry, I'm in the middle of a renovation and moving house. And my five-year-old niece wanted to share the bed with me last week. And I didn't want to wake her up at five in the morning. So... That's why I couldn't make it last week. But, yeah, I'm sure she would have loved to say hi if I could heal him. She would have been great as a co-host. Yeah, you would have loved that. <laughs> well, Excellent. Well, thank you very much for turning up, and we will obviously see you very soon. Yeah. Bye, everyone. I thought Ian was going to say something, Ian, but... <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Goodbye, Melissa. <laughs> Take care. Speak to you soon. Sure, hear that on the podcast. Right. Quickly to yourself, know. Alex, and then we get to Fuji. Just wanted to add to what 400 drums was saying. Uh, he mentioned that uh, 300 ceremonies for, for over a decade to become a, a master shaman with ayahuasca. When I was in Gabon with ayahuasca... Hang on, I think he said it was a year. I think he said 12 what? years. We're doing 300 a day, Ryan, you're saying? No, Not 300 you a year. 100 a year for 12 years to become like a master shaman. Yeah, 300 shaman. a year. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That makes sense, right? So <clears throat> I knew this when I was in Gabon. And uh, I found out that the master Iboga shaman uh, had only three ceremonies. And I thought, oh, three? Uh, so then, but after I, after I had my own Iboga ceremony, I realized that three Iboga ceremonies is like 3,000 ayahuasca ceremonies, which is why I, I always consider Iboga to be the, the most potent and powerful psychedelic, uh, regardless of... People often say DMT, and that, but I, I think it's the pure iboga root. It's extremely intense. So I think that's interesting. That it shows how, how strong it can be if you, if you only need three to become a master shaman in, in Gabon compared to ayahuasca. But I still uh, consider ayahuasca to be my own personal plan to teach. It does take about a week to recover from a full iboga flood as well. So that, that does make a lot of sense for sure. Yeah. I have a friend who took her two years. <laughs> so yeah, but it can be one week to two years. You have oh. an episode as well, don't you, Alex? Do. On Well, it, both of you it, do. Yeah, many on iboga. <laughs> Excellent. Right, Fuji, long time no speak. How are you? I'm going to give you 10 I'm seconds. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm here. That's okay. Yeah, I, just, <laughs> I thought I'd get round to you and you put your hand up. You're probably on the other side of the room, not close to the I phone. Thought, then. I thought I would start dinner <laughs> and I put my phone down in the other room. Um, so I just wanted to mention as far as breath work and its effectiveness, um, I used to, and I still do, I'm not a regular, I'm not afflicted by panic attacks all the time. I've only had, say, half a dozen uh, instances of having panic attacks, but I've had them sometimes at the most inconvenient of times while I'm driving on the way to work. And um, one thing that I found that works is, of course, the breathing techniques, Wim Hof, but also one day instinctively, I just started to make a deep guttural or resonant sound within me. 
And it, it completely went away when combined with the breath work. And basically, the sound I was making was just like an ohm, but saying it in a way that it, you can feel it resonating within your chest. And I tell you what, it takes away panic attacks, at least for me, too sweet <laughs> right away. So um, it is very powerful. And I think with everything that language and making resonating frequencies within you, you know, are going to have uh, sort of like a doubling effect or a magnifying effect with the breath work, um, similar to you know, the the Indians chanting, the American Indians chanting, or uh, any other type of chanting, it, it seems to go along with the breath work or just saying the om in a real deep resonating way helps you to breathe correctly. It could be that, why it, it's so much more powerful when you do that. But I just wanted to throw that out there. If anyone's suffering attacks, that works for me. If I feel one coming on, I start doing that and it, and it subsides completely. That's very good advice. Yeah. Cause you come from a healing environment, don't you? I try and heal everything naturally. Um, I don't myself take any type of pharmaceutical. I haven't for years except for birth control pill and, um, which I stopped, and um, I used to take ibuprofen, the uh, 800 milligram, the prescribed version, and um, I stopped taking that as well. And so I really don't take any pharmaceuticals, whether it's over-the-counter or prescribed, and I haven't for years. I've treated different, and this is just my, not only, I I went to school for nutrition in college, but um, in my senior year, I dropped out because I didn't believe in anything that they were teaching me. Um, I, I was coming at it more from a holistic approach. And since then, you know, I've, I've helped family and friends with different afflictions, whether it's my mom and her liver or my dad just now has gone through lung cancer. And um, he he did the chemotherapy. He didn't do radiation. He did the chemotherapy like the doctors recommended at a, at one of the most prestigious institutes around here in Florida, Moffitt cancer center, but I'm not a believer in it. And, you know, I, I told, I kept telling him, I'm like, dad, I can take care of this. All you have to do is, you know, take what I tell you. And I'm glad he didn't stop you know, I'm glad that he took the advice of the doctor into chemo because had it not worked, the guilt that would have been on me, you know, for not healing him and it getting worse um, would have been much more. But the amazing thing is he agreed to do, you know, take all the supplements I gave him in addition to going and getting treatment. And the doctors were just flabbergasted at how quickly he recovered. And oh, definitely. Like, if you're a... Uh... Oh, basically reinforcing the system, right? which is being depleted by what's going on in that kind of treatment. At at first, they were like, why are you taking all this stuff, you know, all the supplements? And, you know, he said, you know, my daughter um, is really good with supplements, and this is what she recommended. And nothing was um, counterintuitive to what he was doing. So he continued taking the supplements. And, yeah, they, they basically, within six weeks, had reduced his treatments. And within two and a half months, stopped his treatments completely. He was done. That was it. Which, you know, in cancer treatment, that's not long at all. Not at all. No. So, yeah. So now he's in remission. And But I do. I come from the holistic side and can try and treat everything that way. Um, Which is fantastic. The body, you know, he, we're equipped. Our immune system is there for a reason. We're equipped to take care of ourselves. And, you know, with the pharmaceuticals, they're just creating more problems. They're not, they're not treating the solution. They're just treating symptoms, and it creates more problems. So, yeah, that's my background. So if anyone has a question, you know, they can always shoot one towards me. Definitely follow you. Now, public service announcements probably stop in a half hour's time. I'm going to get through the questions here. Ian, are you quite happy to have your question to Alex about his experiences a bit later on while we quickly get through these other questions, or would you like it answered now? No, you crack on. It's absolutely fine. Okay, so Shadow Fox, Willow, Myron, Zoom, and then 
we'll get back to Ian. So if we can try and keep everything in a kind of three minute route, then we can get through them. And if there's any other questions as well. Yeah, no, I'm actually, I'm really good because 400 drums definitely uh, made some of the points that um, we were going to bring up. So we're good. <laughs> That's excellent. That's quickly done. Superb. Right, Willow. Likewise, I feel very, just so grateful for all of you. Thank you so much. I'm eternally grateful for everyone. Superb. And we feel the same way about you coming into the room. Right, we can zip into Myron now. Yeah, mine's short and sweet. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting that, that uh, marijuana, uh, uh, it's not a, the greatest drug for epilepsy, but it does work uh, to control seizure. Um, a lot of people use it. In fact, it's one of the oldest uh, drugs that people use forever to treat epilepsy um, and still do. The, the oldest method is starvation, which is which causes ketosis. And, and the ketosis, for some reason, uh, controls the chemistry of the brain and, and reduces the seizures. But cannabis definitely has been used as an anticonvulsant for centuries, like thousands of years. So there's nothing new about it. Um, doctors today don't prescribe it much. They, they usually use it for other methods, other things like cancer and stuff. But I just wanted to add that, that, that cannabis was, is an anticonvulsant and works as an anticonvulsant. That's my whole thing. That's really amazing to know with what goes on. And uh, Alex, have you heard of that within other cultures using it? Um, cannabis. Um, well, for well, epilepsy to kind of control in that way. I oh, just yeah. wondered if... No, I, I've only seen that like uh, medical science have been using it for that. But uh, yeah, I didn't know that. No, neither did I. So this is good. And on to... Oh, by the way, I see that we've got some new people in the room. Hopefully they can go and have a look at the guidelines and just literally the key ones are be friendly to everyone, use family-friendly language, please ask before you put anything into the shared area because we've had some spamming things going on and we're trying to avoid that. So, Zoom, on to yourself. Thanks again. Um, hey, on the breathwork from a very big fan called Tim, I think on Twitter he's called, and he is a, I'm not plugging him, it's just personal experience. He's been, he focuses on the two moment. He comes from the training sort of school. Um, but yeah, my question is uh, sort of out to everyone about their thoughts about sound, its translation or transmission through the digital space in terms of its, I guess, purity, effectiveness. Obviously, there's nothing like the real thing. The best arts and experience things directly, presently with people. But yeah, just really interested in how how it's uh, possibly changed through experiencing it through the internet. So you think that instead of having a nice natural wave pattern going to a squared off kind of the up and down of your wave could be losing potential, you're saying? Yeah, it's it's a kind of an open. Look. Okay, well, our sound expert is Lee, but Alex will go first. Uh, I think the only thing you lose is the individual, for instance, if it's singing, the individual singing. If they're singing in front of you, I mean, you hear the sound, but you also get the energy from the living thing sitting in front of you. But my experience listening to the medicine songs is that they're equally effective. Uh, digital, I mean, listening to it through headphones on a recording as they are live. The thing that the live adds is the person. But you know, I mean, the voice is the same. Because there's also the added benefit. If you're next to somebody, your brain's actually syncing up when you're doing these kind of activities if you're next to people. So it'll be interesting to know whether the brain syncs to a recording as well. Shadow Fox or Lee, depending on who's answering. Yeah, I'm a, it, it's Lee. <laughs> okay, we're kind of hooked up here real tight with cord. Trying to <laughs> revitalize you. Hang on. I just want to put out that on the podcast, this is headphones, nothing kind of dodgy nature. Okay, everyone, if you're tied up very tight with cords, this is just not going to sound right. <laughs> Really good. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> okay, listen. Each person in the body has a pitch, their own resonant capacity to handle the tonality that comes through either through the cosmos, through the planet, or through music itself, or through other people. 
this is what we as individuals respond to is this individual pitch. So there are pitches that I myself resonate to, a lot of classical music, unless it's like Tchaikovsky, <laughs> because it's so broad, so mysterious, that it doesn't resonate with my body, which are harmonic, which presumably harmonic, and, and reaching for that structure of perfection. So in anything, in the healing aspect, must be directed according to that person's pitch. How do you find that pitch? I don't know. I've heard it. I've listened to it. I understand it. And I present to it. Okay? That's all I can tell you, except that those healing modalities, which presume to say, oh, we're going to give you beautiful music or this or that, may not do what is qualified for you. You as an individual have your own particular qualification and tone tonality it's like the difference if we are listening um to a song like on you know whether it be the radio the internet a record m m3 m3 p mp3 whatever that is or if you're at a concert and it really depends on i believe the um the emotional component that you're actually standing in so for me i prefer not to be at a concert i would prefer to listen to the, the music um because we can always alter any frequency through our intent so we can actually intend that those frequencies be the highest resonance for us to be able to receive that information or that healing component so it is always up to each individual to set that intent there's other people that you know they they will get much more out of something being in a live version of it um again it's we how do you how do you actually choose to receive that sound resonance again if you're in an environment where there are 3,000 other people shouting and singing along with you then that is more an emotional aspect than it is a pitch yep so i does that does that help clarify anything for you yeah that's really interesting i guess i was thinking about the way altered, whether it's through compression it seems to be uh, reducing the, the work a computer needs to process what it was running if something was being from the experience and that there's a strange conspiracy the music industry changing for 40 or from 4 through 240 because you're going into the tesla realm and then the ones that are dissonance which makes it incorrect yeah zoom i guess that's right yeah yeah because the other thing is you got to look at caves and singing into caves and having the sound coming bouncing back and then you got the architecture of churches and caverns as well so like canyons they've all got the different ways of reflecting the sound to give you basically a sound bath but through a natural formation that's there or a man-made one if you've got the acoustics of churches in the western kind of environment yeah i guess i'm, I'm leaning towards this idea that everything is so similar like any cheap version of Oh, um, we can we can definitely agree with that. Again, anything that comes off from the internet, you're always going to have that that frequency and energy of the actual mechanism that you're receiving it on. Absolutely. Um, it, it again, it's but there is there are times like for instance that I may not necessarily be able to access that um, sound in any other manner other than getting it from the internet, for instance. We well, have to understand reverberation versus resonance. The two are distinct from each other, and that's what ha has to mm, occur so, for, so far as understanding what you're receiving. Oh, definitely. It's uh, an amazing thing to look at and try and put together. Before I get to... Let's make sure I get the list correct, and we're still there, which is good. Fuji? Hi. Has anyone here heard of um, or seen the new song of the New Earth with Tom Kenyon? It's, he's, um, he works with sound. I forget what his specialty is, but he works with sound. And um, 
everything that you guys are talking about today is in that. I adore that. It is just, I've seen it several times. It's, I, I, it's available, I think, on Amazon, Gaia, if you have Gaia. Song of the New Earth, just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, you're right. It's on Prime. I've just spotted it there. And also there are trailers on YouTube as well. So that's good. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I, I didn't see if anyone put their hands up. Did you see it, Alex? Or know of it? And <clears throat> No. I'll try and get a link out and put it into the shared section. Ian, forward with your question to Alex. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you could um, just enlighten us a little bit on your personal experiences with the um, plants and the shamanism. Uh, sh sure. <clears throat> There's a lot that can be said, but I'll try to keep it uh, so maybe others can get something from it because i know you can have more than three minutes i will be gracious on that you can do more than <laughs> no what i mean is I'm, I'm i'm aware that some people here have probably done psychedelics and and it might not be that fun to have like trip reports i mean we could do space like that at some point but uh, there are some interesting aspects of of these uh, shamanistic ceremonies i've taken uh, or been a part of and uh, when it comes to the ayahuasca, something I often think when I read or articles about it or people talk about it is they, they don't mention so much uh, the plant teachers, which is something I didn't expect myself. Uh, it was a surprise to me the first time I did it. But they're actually, the plant teachers are actually there. So the, the shaman or the curandera ayahuasquero or ayahuasquera, uh, they are mediators. So they are not the ones, that, it's not the shaman uh, that's healing you or working on you. It's the plant uh, doctors or plant teachers. Uh, they, they have both names. Uh, and these like doctors, you can see them uh, standing over uh, your own or others' bodies, like almost like doing surgery or, or sometimes sitting on the shoulders of the shamans or, or standing next to them, uh, walking around, uh, working on people. So it's like uh, being in a hospital full of doctors. Uh, and I've seen this many times, and, um, and I'm not the only one. It's a very common feature, uh, and I think it, it's, uh, it's extremely fascinating. And uh, these uh, doctors, these plant doctors, they, um, uh, they move through space and time, uh, which makes them not an hallucination. Because if you see a hallucination and uh, you see it and you look away and then you look back, the hallucination uh, will not have, it won't move. But these doctors, if they, if they walk towards you and you look away and you look back, they've traversed space and time. They're closer because they, they've kept walking when you were not looking. I think this is extremely fascinating and uh, has been a very profound experience making it it makes it re very real, and uh, and uh, so that's one aspect uh, I think I want to share. Uh, when it comes to ayahuasca, and I guess iboga as well, and, uh, um, is that there are like ten traditional experiences you can have, um, and I've had most of them. Like one is like the death experience, uh, which is the best experience. Uh, fear and going through hell is, uh, I think, the best uh, challenge or the most challenging uh, experiences you can have, but it's also they're, they're also the most healing. And uh, I think they're, they're not fun when you're having them, but uh, they are the, the ones I learn the most from. And I'd like you, to ask you a question. Yeah. You talk about the death ones are the best ones to have. When you answer... The reason I've asked this is because we've heard from many other people and it might have been you weren't there at the end of last week's one when we kind of amassed a bit of information about people talking about these experiences. So I'd like your answer, then I'll give you the information that we collated last week. Why do you say the death ones are the best ones? Because they, um, uh, well, because you die. And uh, you realize uh, your life is finished, and uh, it brings it's like a near death death experience, but it's it's in a safe environment. You don't have to be go through a car crash or something like that because uh, I understand that people who have had those can have similar life changing uh, um, 
ideas or life changing situations. So it's like you die and you you. Um, it's really hard to explain. It's like you know, it's like dying, but uh, you're still alive. So when you come back, you you can change your life for the better. It's like a huge slap in the face. I guess is the best way. Okay, so it's a different angle from the people that we were talking to. And again, we've got a few of them in the actual room. And they basically said that once they were taken to the next, well, again, words don't fit correctly, to the next realm, they didn't want to come back at all because they it was such a more intense and emotional kind of environment. And then when they came back, it was kind of like they were home in that place where here is a completely different environment, which is kind of harsh compared to the other place. That's oh, what I see we had, what you're wasn't it, Ian? Yeah, yeah, dude, it was. I, I see what you're saying. Well, I would say that uh, <clears throat> when you're going to the psychedelic realm, especially the ayahuasca realm, it feels like home. So, it, you know, um, it's a nice place to go to. But um, uh, I'm, when I'm saying the death experience, I mean the actual the actual uh, dying bit. Like, oh no, I'm dying. I'm dying. I'm gonna die now. Like, it's not the afterlife experience. I, I mean, I mean the actual experience of dying. And I'm not talking about like if you have a near death experience and you, let's say, you go to heaven or whatever, and you have that experience. I don't mean that. I just mean the actual death. Yeah, so it's going to be difficult for people who haven't experienced it to really kind of get a grip on to. So, yeah, it's uh, a fascinating one to try and convey. And also the where you morph and you you transform into something else. You're not yourself anymore. It can also be a, a very good experience. But frankly, the you can have uh, experiences on, on Iboga and Ayahuasca where it's not really visual. Uh, it can be a life review where, where you just go through your memories, uh, your whole life. So uh, it doesn't have to be the fireworks, you know, to be to be healing. It can also be those kinds of things. Oh, definitely. Shadow Fox, you've got contribution. Yeah, because I just like to make a mention of what um, he, uh, he's speaking about is that death experience. Okay, doesn't we're not speaking about going to the other realm. The actual experience thereof, because most, I mean, think about it. What is people's greatest fear? It they fear death. And then when we, when people utilize um, the tools at hand, such as the plant medicine, it can give us that. Um, uh, experience without literally experiencing it and this is where it can be our greatest teachers this is what he's speaking about is that formation because once we face that fear and which is one of the biggest ones what do we have to fear and this is where um, the, uh, plant medicine can be an you know an asset to everyone and it, it this is where what i was speaking about also is it creates that um kind of like that common bond that now we can speak on it we can share that experience like oh my gosh this is what i did and i you know experienced death and you know it's guess what it's not as bad as everybody says it is or we think about it or we fear it it's like death where is thy and so it, it allows us to live life more harmoniously without you know, i'm not going to go jump out of a perfectly good airplane because i could die all right we are we are allowing ourselves that freedom because fear is what limits us so i just had to say that sorry <laughs> No, I mean, that's all right, because you're also shaking off the priorities of this kind of existence as well, from what you're saying, to going back to a more basic yes. thought yes. and feeling rather than thinking about how many socks you're wearing. Yes, exactly. And and it's like, and these were the things that my guide showed me. And yes, I've had two near-death experiences, but mine were, were different than um, me like saying, oh, I'd like to stay here. Um, mine was very, very different within that realm. Um, yes, there are no words for expression, and there's many people that do express it very, very well. But I signed up to come back to do and to give 
a message to the world. And so it was like I knew that there was a duty, there was a, a purpose for this being shown to me. And so um, I just raised my hand and said, this one will. And it was like an obligation. And so therefore, being in that realm, it was like so, sometimes so many people are just overwhelmed with the sense of, if it's a good trip, so to speak, of love. And there's others that are totally terrified. And so, again, it's like there are no words for expression. There just are not. Oh, definitely. I know we got a question from Zoom. And then obviously, Alex, are you responding to Shadow Fox? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, well put, I just wanted to add that uh, concerning death, my belief, and from what I've heard others say as well, is that uh, there is no break in consciousness ever. It is it is uh, forever. And uh, so uh, there's no stress about it because you're not going to like, not everything's not going to go black and then you wake up in some other world. There's no break, it's continuous. And I think that's uh, both... Uh, uh, interesting and freaky in a way but... oh definitely especially some of the accidents i've had and the way that i've had visions and visions information of what i was going through when i could see my body elsewhere and i had no actual physical eyes to see it with that was kind of peculiar so that kind of gave me a clue that there's something completely different going on so zoom I've got so many questions for you. Start with one. Mm. <laughs> um, I come to a real... Can I just ask you, Zoom, are you quite away away from your microphone? You sound a bit quiet. Sorry. About the same. Ian, is he sounding quiet to you? Uh, yeah, he is a little bit, actually. So, Mike, good evening. Mike Frito is an author who I recommend people go and follow, the same as I recommend people go and follow Mycelium, 400 Drums, obviously... I wish those little icons were better, but it's Mark under metal. I can't read it in this. Ian, all you those little up. tiny. Can you read Mark's full Twitter ID? Because all the little circles and all the little ones in there, it's metal oh, something. Yeah, hang on. Yeah, it says metamorphic. Yeah, my Mark. eyes. Going to change them. Mike, how are you doing? Hey, Mike. Hey, guys. How are you? Instead of finding the unmute. It's nice to hear you're out in nature. Yeah, I'm actually I'm on the, the subway and I'm heading to see some music. So, but I've been listening and great company, and uh, I've learned a lot. Really, thanks, thanks everyone for your uh, your uh, wisdom. Which band are you going to see? It's a band called Mid Sun, and they're a kind of, kind of hybrid of people that are classically trained who play bluegrass music. So it's you know, they, it's like a hybrid of jazz, bluegrass. Classical. This is the one you've been promoting recently, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. They got a kind of yellow background with red text, and they were standing against a wall. Exactly. I met with guitarists uh, a couple of days ago. I did like an interview with them. Uh, I'm going to meet, you know, see them perform, and I'm going to write up a kind of album. They just had an album, and I, I highly recommend it. But those are my musical tastes. You guys are all see it if you follow me. I'll put it out there. So I, I'll need a couple of weeks to write it up. Excellent. While you're out there, could you tell them all of our names and just say hello to them from us? That'd be good. I will. I will. I'll shout it out. But the music I've been listening to and, you know, Yung Shin Lamo session yesterday where she talked about the power of music and healing. Um, I recommend anyone who's interested in message me, Yung Shin Lamo, and I'll send you some info. Uh, I love her music. I love her stuff. And he's about and it's right up the alley of what you've all been talking. And I'm going to get oh, the definitely. sound of the roar of a New City subway train is going to come blasting. So I'm going to go on mute, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for the soundscape. Thanks, guys. See you all. So there you go. We're getting people in from all over the place in all strange locations. Not bad that we can get him if he's underground. Zoom, you remembered your question. Um, it was fascinating to learn that specific spirit animal come up during Jag the Snake Present. And then you started talking about these sort of plant teachers, which was fascinating. It sounded a lot. Some people seem to experience like DMT beings of astral style. Yeah, it's just wondering about your thoughts on that like, so, and how how much of a crossover there is between us. Well, <clears throat> um, comparing first of all, comparing ayahuasca with DMT, I would say there's a lot of similarities. But I think the ayahuasca is warmer. It feel it's the DMT is. I guess you could, a good allegory would be DMT is like a modern superhero film with CGI 
whereas ayahuasca is more an old school superhero film where they don't use CGI, where they use practical effects. Uh, it feels more uh, uh, plastic, I guess. The ayahuasca is, 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 feels more alive. I don't know. But I, I, I don't say one is better or is bad or anything. It's just that that's just the sense I get from it. But I, I, I like both. Uh, the only thing I don't like, well, it's probably it's pretty good. It's, it's quick and short because it can be quite intense. But what I like with ayahuasca is that it takes, it, it's slower also. You can process everything easier. The DMT is so fast, it's getting hit by a train. So I, I do prefer the ayahuasca, but um, uh, sometimes I take a dive into the DMT. Uh, when it comes to the spirit animals, <clears throat> with ayahuasca, it's, it's mainly the anaconda, which and uh, and also serpents. And they, uh, what I've been told, they represent ayahuasca. So, for instance, if you if you uh, get a lot of snakes going into you or something like that, the shaman usually thinks that you should drink more uh, because the ayahuasca is trying to get into you more. So you should drink more. Uh, I have never seen uh, serpents or snakes or anacondas in any ayahuasca ceremony. So the animal I've seen the most has been the jaguar. And uh, the interesting thing for me has always has been also that I started seeing the jaguar before I drank the ayahuasca. Uh, I was already in the Amazon and it came to me in, in very vivid. You know the kind of dream you have where you think you've woken up but you're still asleep? Uh, in those kinds of dreams, the jaguar entered my hut, uh, and then I it also came back during the ceremony. This is what, going back to what I said earlier, where I think the, the ayahuasca ceremony starts way before you actually drink it, which is sounds weird, but it's what it's like. Uh, with the iboga, it was more um, uh, realistic, where you uh, meet ancestors, more human human figures, and uh, other kinds of animals like. For instance, like lions and elephants, and it's very like African in a sense. Uh, but um, yeah, the, it's a very crowded place, both the iboga and the ayahuasca. Uh, I think more so than mushrooms. Uh, it's extremely crowded with with uh, entities of all sorts, and some of them prob- can also not be benign, you know. Uh, but I have a trick I learned from a shaman where if, if I encounter a being. And I become afraid. Uh, I, I ask if it's the medicine. And if it doesn't go away, it is the medicine. So I don't have to fear it. I've always used that trick. But I remember one time I asked a, a being. It was like kind of like a very scary looking being. I asked if it was the medicine. And it, it started to walk away from me. Uh, so I realized it wasn't the medicine. It was like a, a bad entity. And so when it was walking away, I kind of taunted it, like, yeah, 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 get out of here. I'll use that. Excellent. So 10 minutes more. I should have stopped 14 minutes ago, but what we'll do is I'm just going to say thank you to Shadow Fox as she's just having to go. And she says thank you very much for all the information and all the people sharing in here, which is great. So Myron's going to be the last person. And what I've got is Eric, then Shaman and Myron. And then if we can keep it short and sweet, and that'd be good because we've had such a really good evening with different conversations here. And again, as I said, this is basically a primer and we can dig deeper with Alex later on with deeper subjects that we want to go into. Can't we, Alex? Yes. Yes, sure. That's good. Right. So, Eric, nice to meet you. I don't think I have spoken to you before unless you've changed your icon. That's right. Thank you for having me on. I don't think we've uh, talked before, but yeah, it's an honor to be be here as a speaker. So thanks for giving me the mic. No problem. Can I ask uh, you how you found us? Just through, um, and I I have changed my profile name and and that sort of thing. So I have tuned in 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 months prior uh, Ah, as as a listener. And so uh, I don't recognize your voice. (laughs) There you go. Uh, I just want to say hi to everyone in the group and thank you for holding the space uh, to the host and the co-host. And I follow a few of you already. Um, And hi, Shaman. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from Shaman uh, speaker. Shaman Safford and uh, Myron at the end. I'm fascinated with uh, shamanism, and it's only been in the in the last um, month or two. And uh, you know, you know, th- th- there's a saying. Um, if you well, saying I heard from somebody else. If you if you hear uh, hear something from three different people, you should kind of pursue that thing. 
And for me, that's uh, shamanism, uh, kind of, you know, out of the blue for me. Um, I'm in Canada, uh, central Canada, where, uh, you know, there are a strong indigenous presence. And uh, I've never, I've never, you know, really come into contact with too many indigenous uh, people up until maybe adulthood. Um, and now this, this kind of subject has come across uh, kind of my life. And, and so I'm fascinated by it. And, and I'm definitely going to check out Alex's podcasts uh, on, on topics of shamanism. And, and also sure. definitely follow 400 Drums, which is, yep. have you done, seen how they spelt it? Because it's just the number 400, then drums, and then dot .com. And you got the 400 Drums account here as well in Twitter to follow. They're on Discord and many other places. Good to know. Thank you very much. I, th- I think I gave them a follow, but um, yes. So, so th- thanks for that. I, I heard 400 drums speak earlier. Um, uh, I want. I just wanted to ask Alex and uh, and anybody else. I guess um, maybe the, the the next few speakers, if if they can touch on this, is uh, how how you would recommend. I, I'm I'm going to go down the rabbit hole as much like these podcasts and articles and you name it. But uh, what would be um, practical tips? Finding a mentor, for example. Or getting into shamanism uh, obviously there's no one way but i'd love to uh, get into it myself well uh, I, I i would suggest that well the teacher will always appear so uh, i don't necessarily think you need to look for a teacher or anything like that uh, if if uh, if there is a teacher that wants you as a student uh, it will appear but you also don't need i mean it can help but you can also do it on your own and and in my case i don't have a really a human teacher i have many different indigenous uh, shamans that I often call like my indigenous mom or dad or brother, you know, more like family members because uh, I'm so connected to them. Uh, but my teacher is the plants. So uh, and the plants you can grow yourself. So if you want a, a teacher, a plant teacher, you can easily get that, I guess would be my suggestion. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, sometimes we have to be reminded of these simple, uh, simple truths that the uh, teacher will appear. So yeah, that helps because you know with, with me, uh, sometimes overthinking gets in the way, but it's it's so simple. So I, I appreciate you rem- reminding me of that, and uh, yeah, I look forward to listening to your podcast episodes on. Thanks again. I've worked it out. We spoke in January. That's why it's taken me a while to get my brain in gear. Ah, uh, okay, no problem. And, and I had a different uh, profile username and profile picture, but yeah, um, I look forward to more of these spaces. Thank you. Excellent. Not a problem, but hopefully the answers that Alex gave you were good. So now we're going to Shaman Safford. Hello. I, I, wanna, I also want to second the thanks for your guest for appearing. I look forward to uh, checking out the cast. I uh, thought I would address two things about what's left my time. Uh, the warmness uh, that he addressed on fresh ayahuasca versus, you know, some bull or something. Uh, one of the uh, concepts is similar uh, I do reference Hinduism uh, many times because I draw from many, many different traditions. But Hinduism thinks of this in terms of the vitality of your food. So, for instance, a fresh cooked meal in front of you has far more vitality to it than leftovers. And you know, they'd have more than, say, in the can. And that's why that appeal of food has, is you know, so primally deep there and ayahuasca fresh the entire ritual and everything that goes around it is like having entire meal versus just a vitamin tells you or a pill tells you what meal should um the other thing i wanted to uh address was uh, uh, uh alex you had mentioned you had seen a serpent i mean i'm sorry that it's versus the serpent immediately resonated with me because i've seen the serpent uh quite so uh and the two are inextricable together in at least Aztec uh, mythology. In fact, looking into the history of the tribes, I don't want to take up the rest of the, the time on that. But you might check that out. Actually, if you uh, uh, if you're interested, there's a book, Flight of the Feathered Serpent. I believe it's called. Uh, I believe it's by uh, Joseph Campbell. His relation to the monomyth or not, but you might check that out. It goes into some of the uh, uh, history of uh, Quetzalcoatl, feathered serpent, versus Tezcatlipoca, the the jaguar or smoking mirror. Anyway, I will uh, I will bow out again. Thank you so much for having us this subject and everything. Was that the Peter Ballin book? Yeah, it might have been. It's a purple book with a golden serpent. Yes, feathered I'm serpent just gonna there. put that into the shared section. saying so I found it that. Was- one of the very first books that I ever found on the subject. Excellent. I'll see if I can get that in there. Did you want to say something, Alex, before we get on to yeah, Myron? Yeah, yeah very quickly. 
I'll check the book. I actually have the book. I have many books. I, it's just on, on my to-do list. Uh, but I, I'll dig it up. Uh, I want to say a quick thing about the Jaguar. might be interesting to some. I don't know. But uh, for me, the reason the Jaguar appeared is because I had... I had uh, I was suffering a lot. Uh, I saw the insanity of Samsara and like, being reborn, and you know I won't go into it. But it, I had a hellish time, and the jaguar kept appearing. And then I finally realized that uh, you know what is a jaguar? It's a jaguar. It's not all these different masks it might have. It's only a jaguar. Meaning that uh, the reason the the way you can live your life through eternity i mean many lives or when you die whatever happens if you have if, if you have to you have to stay focused with your like integrity you have to remain uh, who you are you can't just stop going back and forth and if you if you do that uh, you will enter this inner calm that's it. that's what it was for me the jaguar uh, so it, it came like a teacher it, it might not uh, translate to others but it, it, that's that's what I got from it in my ceremonies. That's good. And we can get to Myron and then, Rian, you're very lucky. I'll squeeze you in because nobody else has got their hand up and that'd be it. So um, am, I, am I up? Is that what's You happening? are, you are. Okay, I just want to say two things. One, um, my power animal has always been crows. I mean, from the very, very, very beginning. Um, even in my hospital room when I came out of the coma, there were crows with Garon. So, and it's crows that took me away and when I was being abused and all the rest, even though they were giant crows, they were still crows. Second, um, I wanted to talk about vibration and music a little bit. I think people don't understand that, that uh, modern recordings are not really sound. There are zeros and ones. If, there, if it's a digital recording, there is no vibration on a digital recording. It's, it's zeros and ones. It's just data. So you would have to go back to analog sound to get vibration, like an old LP or something, or even better, drum ceremonies, like everybody's talking about, drum ceremonies or, or bells or, ba- or, or bowls or any of that stuff that creates real vibration because uh, digital, digital music is not music. It's just data. So it doesn't have those re- those those overtones that are automatically de- built in to vibration those overtones don't exist they have to be they have to be digitally programmed to make it work so so there's a difference between those two things i just wanted to make that point and especially about everybody's talking about jaguars i just wanted to talk about how important the crow was in my in my and is in my whole experience in life and all the things that i've gone through Crows have always been my magic animal, um, and they speak to me and take me places that are wonderful. So that's that's it. I'll let you go. I know you want to get out of here. Bye. It was Alex talking about jaguars. We're not going to have that quick. I know once we say a certain time, it always takes a little while to go. So hi, nice to see you, John. Haven't seen Coffee Addict for around for a while. And also, Jeffrey, nice to see you in. So coming back to yourself, Ryan. Yeah, I just wanted to, because I know a lot of the conversation has been uh, like ayahuasca and, and stuff like that. And I just wanted to also point out, uh, for example, much of the the Western um, understanding or at least um, appropriation or, or, or starting to step into psychedelic culture was from Gordon Wasson um, going to Mexico and meeting Maria Sabina, bringing back a little bit, I wouldn't say of the mushroom tradition, but of bringing back the understanding of, of psilocybin mushrooms. Um, and that's a lot of people's understanding with, uh, with mushrooms. And it doesn't often go more in depth than that. But I just wanted to also mention uh, there are rich and beautiful um, cultures around the use of mushrooms, not only for healing, but for deep shamanic work. Um, I, I did a podcast uh, episode 10 of my podcast is with an amazing, um, amazing author. I think a lot of you, you guys would, would really appreciate it by Michael Stewart. Ani. it's called ghost dance an unhold an untold history of the Americas. So he did a, a, a lot of work. He's done much worth in South America, helped fight previous pandemics uh, with the Yanomami tribe. 
um, back when they were uh, previously un- uncontacted and, and helped them uh, make it through the pandemic. And now they're, they're contacted and all that stuff. Um, but he did a lot of work uh, in uh, Hot Leather Jimenez and, and, and around Mexico and all this stuff of connecting with cultures who have some of the original I don't even like saying that, but some of the original teachings that they're still connected to from um, American shamanism of North America and South America. He talks about back in the the, um, the Mayan and Aztec times and previously, there is a line of unbroken um, shamanism, for lack of a better word, but shamanism itself comes from Siberia. So it's, it's different words depending on the culture. Um, but the importance of the mushroom ceremonies and the velada, which is the uh, um, th- the name of the mushroom ceremony. So I just I just wanted to mention that because it has such beautiful and interesting history that's tied into all this. So the ghost dance, for example, is a, a, a very North American cultural practice um, that that was banned in the 1800s, uh, and no Indigenous people in I think probably America and Canada were able to practice their cultural. Um, practices until i think like 1960 or so um including the ghost dance which is just the dance but there's a lot a lot more to it so i just wanted to mention that because even through the ayahuasca cultures through the deep shamanic cultures there are these threads that really do connect them in really fascinating ways um and and I think that's it's it's just an interesting and important con- part of the conversation that a lot of people don't know necessarily the depths of some of that connection. So I'd recommend checking out his book absolutely because it goes into a lot of this. And even in the book, there's a a, a mention of when because the creation it's not like they were taking mushrooms and then started doing veladas. They used to work previously with and still do um, in the Sierra Mazateca region. Uh, where, where the Mazatec people are and where Mayan culture was, they do a lot of work with Salvia divinorum. This is a plant that for the most part does not at all grow wildly. And it was put and planted over a mountaintop to, for them to be able to continue their, uh, their work. But it's a, it's, it's kind of a very mysterious psychedelic plant right now that works on a completely different set of, um, uh, of receptor sites in the brain. But what's interesting is even in the, um, in the book, there's just a, a throwaway mention of the square stemmed uh, sage plant that taught them how to do velada. So it's similar when you're thinking of ayahuasca and these kind of things, the way that they were taught how to do ceremonies and these kind of things, or even find ayahuasca to begin with, is one of those questions that we don't really understand besides someone like Jeremy Narby um, telling everyone that the plants told them, um, or that maybe tobacco or one of these other master plants helped them understand it. Um, and in the Mexico region, it was Salvia divinorum that taught them how to work with mushrooms and the Dishito entity in um, in their their very special mushroom. Um, so I, I just kind of wanted to mention all that because I think it is an interesting part of the conversation that a lot of people don't know that history too much. And Could Salvia you... is such a curious uh, plant. <laughs> Could you actually tweet that actual book? That would be great with obviously yeah. my ID included. And you said Valadas. How do you spell that? Because I couldn't. L-A-D-A. And what those are, are um, just to quickly give a summary, it's essentially, it's it's the ceremony with the mushroom and they will put up an altar with copal resin, incense, um, beeswax candles, fresh flowers every time they do it. And then they'll put up pictures of the, the familial or cultural deities, but also usually because of the um, Spanish conquests and everything like that there will be pictures of jesus and mary and stuff like that that are often um like catholic obviously but are related to land spirits for them pachamama and and the the understandings of uh, our lady of guadalupe um revealing herself to a mexican peasant um yeah there's a there's a lot of really cool cultural things there so i'll, I'll put out a tweet um and i'll tag you in it with Thank with you. the book um I'll, actually i'll just send my podcast because it has the the book title in it and then there's just a little bit of audio but I... did we just lose him i can hear you oh. hello i thought you i thought right Rianne was talking and then disappeared entirely that's okay it was the end of my the end of my ah. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes i can't tell when you're going in for a drop off it just was so quick but it was like <laughs> someone had just killed you mike right okay alex 
Yeah, there's also a cautionary tale there with Maria and, and the mushroom. Uh, because when Gordon Wasson told the world about this experience, the, all the hippies descended on Mexico. And uh, basically, uh, one thing led to another. And the locals got so mad that all these people came there. Her house burned down and basically was destroyed. A similar thing can happen with the ayahuasca in Peru. It hasn't yet, but there's signs of it. So it's important to remember that, uh, you know, try and like, uh, try and make sure when you go to different indigenous communities that you, uh, whatever, whatever you can do to like protect it. So it doesn't become a sh- uh, like a, a gentrified shopping mall <laughs> because uh, then you lose it. Oh, definitely. I have to say, thank you very much for a wonderful four hours, Alex, and everybody else who's been contributing uh, with all the knowledge that's been going on. I'm looking forward to doing this again in further detail when we pick some really deep topics there. I'm sure you're saying the same thing, Ian. Thanks again, Alex. That was absolutely fantastic, um, what you did tonight. And um, yeah, thank you, everybody else, for contributing to it as well. It's been an absolutely brilliant night and I've... uh, Really appreciated a lot of the things that you've uh, you've all been talking about. So uh, again, thank you very much. And I did just share that um, that podcast episode that has that book info, the author, and a cool conversation around the the book. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. And again, if you're wanting another good conversation on the nineteenth, UK. 7 p.m. We've got Laird Scranton, which is a Zoom event. So you will need to go to the link in the bio of this Twitter account. Click on. Laird Scranton, click on that registration, and it's a roundtable like this where he will be coming to talk about the emergence of energy, and that will be another fascinating one if people are interested. And then on the 24th of May, we've got Aaron Voot coming back talking about a lot of information. So basically, he's laying out the groundwork for his information that he's found recently, and it's going to be another good one, and that's going to be on Twitter space as well. So if you're all interested in that, keep up to date with the events list which is in the bio and thank you again for turning up and it's nice to see d and also a few others who have just turned up and we've really enjoyed this and again i've had messages from centered awareness saying that it's been fantastic all the content she's been listening to so thank you very much everybody and we'll be on for the next one bye bye thank you thank you bye bye so much paul not a problem yeah it's been great Definitely. It's been superb. I look forward to talking to you all later on, which would be good. Thank you, Maren. And trying to spot, there's one other it says on here on the list, which I can't see. See you, Mark. And also Nadine. We'll just say hello. And Hi, is it Civil Monkey? I don't think I've spoken to Civil Monkey before. I'm just going to say hello to Mark because he's bound to be there. Jeffy never wanted to say hello. I was going to say hello to him. We, we are all monkeys. Yeah, possibly. And Eva Rose, nice to see you as well. Mark. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for bringing me up. And let me thank everybody for just the wonderful conversation. It was just brilliant. I was on and off listening for, for the four hours. Yeah, it was just absolutely brilliant. Thank you, uh, Natural Born Alchemist and everybody else that spoke. It was just uh, a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful conversation. Very enlightening. Uh, yeah, I've had different calling. I won't get anyone to wrap up, but yeah, I've felt the similar calling in, in that uh, along those. Yeah, it was uh, it was brilliant. Thank you. Look forward to talking to you again. And are you both in the same location? <laughs> it's not Dean there because we're saying hello. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nad, do you want to say hi? <laughs> Dinner in the kitchen here. Sorry, I, I was staying upstairs on the computer. <laughs> so you, guys... you don't have to be sorry. It's okay. <laughs> but... It's just, I don't know whether to say hello to you in separate locations. It might be in two different cars. <laughs> no, I, I, well, I can't talk when I use my desktop computer. Um, the, uh, what I got to love is I had more time to contribute. Um, but it was, I, it was really awesome. I really enjoyed listening to you guys. Um, I've got a question then for Nadine. Uh-oh. If you're listening on your computer. Yes. How come you've got your icon in our room? Because normally browsers don't. I know. Yeah, sometimes sometimes it up. shows up. And... Well, that's new to me. I've always known it as, okay, so that's why some people won't talk to me. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, and that's just, I've, I've got you up on the, up on the laptop. As, uh, was it uh, Ryan, the post, as soon as I did that, as soon as he mentioned that, then I pulled pull you up on the computer and, and then pulled him up in his post. So 
but you're talking through the phone. Yeah, I'm talking right? through the phone now. Yeah. So my yeah. I, my laptop, I show up, but I've had it. I've had I've gone into space others with the laptop while I've been in another my phone, and and I've seen my my icon show show up on the la- on on my phone when when I look at the different spaces too. So it, sometimes it shows up, sometimes it yeah. It's a bit of a ghosting thing when it comes to I know action. on Windows and also Apple there is you can get an Android emulator and then you can load Twitter into it and do it that way. But it's more complex than you can actually use your computer to become in a Twitter space and talk. Well, and they, they are, uh, they're in the works, uh, having the capability to speak through your laptop, through Twitter. I, I'm, I'm, that's yes. what I've heard, yeah. that that's coming out. It's still in okay, the works, well, that'd be good. Because I swapped through it just uh, about 10 minutes ago that my phone was down to 19%. I had to swap out different mics and then swap into the power cable. <laughs> Yeah, that would be really brilliant. Isn't it? Yeah, that would be handy. It should be good. Excellent. Let's say to Jamie hello because he just got bounced out, and then we're going to go. I think Ian at that point because we've done over the time. And Alex, it's just been amazing to have all this content of people talking. Hi, Bye. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Bye. I dropped the out. There. I, but yeah, Jamie, if you want to. All I was going to say was, Ty, sorry I missed most of it, but I'll uh, I'll catch, okay. catch up with everybody. I, the first half an hour I heard was was, was fabulous, but then I've missed the rest. Excellent. Of it. So nice to see you all. Thank you don't have to be sorry. It was just nice to see you turn up. I just thought I'd say hello, <laughs> which is good. Right. And Miro, nice for your turning up and zoom out and ever rose. And hang on. Is that a giraffe? No, hang on. Yes, it is. Right. Oh, they've just gone. I was trying to figure out the name because a speech bubble cloud is difficult to say. You, no, I didn't catch it. She came and went too quickly. Okay. Bye. To help our research and understanding, leave Perceptions Today's podcast reviews, subscribe to the podcast, along with the other social media accounts, and share. Come and join our live events. That way we can get together and have thoughtful discussions along with advancing our understanding of concepts as we go along.